All right, so welcome everyone. This is our last science of for the year for 2022. So today we're going to be talking about water birds. So um, not necessarily just waterfowl. I hope everyone knows that there's lots of different types of birds than just waterfowl, like ducks and geese. So there's tons of other ones that we're going to talk about today and kind of what makes those birds so special. And then really hitting on some of the water birds that we have here in Nebraska that a lot of people don't think about. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started here. Share my screen. All right, hopefully everyone sees the big uh, water birds here. Um, this is a really cool bird. I like this one. It's called the American Avocet. Um, I love their bill and I just really like their colors for some reason. So we'll talk a little bit about those later. Um, but like I mentioned, today is our science of water birds. So uh, thanks for joining us if you've never been here before. And if you have, like I mentioned, welcome back. So um, I hope that you ask questions. I want you to ask questions or have comments or something. Um, please feel free to put those in the chat. We will have little breaks in between our program here that we can stop and look and see what questions you have. Um, but also we will have a small question and answer session at the end. Uh, so if you have something, go ahead and put it in there and I will do my best to get to it when I can. Uh, just make sure that it's on topic and relevant to what we're talking about and that we are nice to everyone. Um, I also want to point out to people that I am by no means an expert in any of the programs that I've done uh, so far, and I'll probably be honest, I'm the least amount of expert in birds. So um, I love birds, and I think they're they're interesting, um, but at the same time, I know like this much compared to a lot of other people. So if you have a question that I am in, unable to answer, I will find someone that can, and I will definitely get back to you. So uh, I do a lot of research for these, but again, by no means an expert. All right, so let's go ahead and jump on into kind of the basics, like what is a water bird? Or when I say that, because when I first did this, I think, um, you know, I thought of like great blue herons and maybe a pelican and stuff like that, but that was missing a huge chunk of some of the other birds out there. And I also don't want people to think that we're just talking about waterfowl today because, I mean, ducks and geese, they're interesting, but like there's a lot of other stuff out there. So, um, when we talk about this, what are water birds? So we all know that no matter what organism you are, you need water to survive. Um, but it might be a little bit different as far as when we talk about a true water bird. So they're important to kind of distinguish because they are part of a bigger picture. They're part of that bigger aquatic ecosystem. And the idea, the true definition of a water bird is that they require that aquatic environment for at least um, all of their life cycle, not part of their life cycle, Cycle or only seasonally, but a part of it. They are, they need it all the time. Um, so there's many different types of water birds and how they use that aquatic ecosystem. They might be shore birds or they might be um, wading birds. But when we talk about that, they live on and around those bodies of water. Some of them have very strict um, requirements when it comes to where they're living and what part of the water they are on, and even the types of water that they need, fresh water versus salt water. Um, but they nest, they breed, they change their plumage depending on the time of year and depending on that water body source as well. Um, and then some of them, again, have those really key requirements as far as their physiological traits that they have developed basically to use that water body or that aquatic environment as, to, as much as they can and as much as they're to advantage. All right. So when we talk about water birds, are they also waterfowl? Yes, we'll get to this in a little bit. Um, but again, don't just think waterfowl. So types of water birds that make up that huge category, they have, like I said, specific morphology, they have size, they have specific adaptations that they have. Um, but this could also mean migrating and non-migrating birds are in that bigger water bird group. Um, so when we talk about water birds, if you think of that as like an umbrella topic, there's two kind of side pieces or branches from that. Uh, we talk about true water birds and then semi-aquatic water birds. So if you don't know what that means, we'll talk about it here in a second. But like all other birds, they're all vertebrates. So we know that birds are vertebrates. They have a backbone on them. They have lungs. Um, 
So they not only sustain themselves from this water body, their food, their breeding, their nesting, reproduction, everything happens there, but they play a very larger role and a crucial ecological role for other birds and other mammals and other fish and that body of water, um, lots of different plants and vegetation as well. Um, for instance, in something like a wetland, um, so it doesn't always have to be a lake or a river or an ocean, it could be just a really good wetland. Um, so they serve as um, good nesting sites for a lot of different types of animals, but specifically birds. And then in return, their birds, the feces of those birds, it helps maintain that ground for the vegetation that grows in the wetland. So it's just, again, a huge cycle of where those animals and the um, environment really connect with each other. All right, so true water birds. When we talk about this, their main um, characteristics is the presence of those anatomical and physiological adaptations. So what do those look like? Um, most of the time, birds that live in or near the water, um, they have a lot of dense plumage um, or their feathers are a little bit more dense than say like a songbird or something like that. Um, most of the time it gets rather chilly um, in the morning, in the evening, during the seasons. Um, and they also need a thicker layer of fat to maintain themselves in those bodies of water. Um, for instance, a specific true water bird, like a cormorant, we have the double crested cormorant in Nebraska, um, they are actually uh, not waterproof, which a lot of birds are, they have the special oil on their feathers that helps them kind of bead that water off of them so they don't get too heavy and they can't fly. But one of the things about cormorants is they lack that oil or they don't have as much as other birds, which kind of doesn't make sense because why would they be a water bird but they're not waterproof? Um, if you've ever seen a cormorant, and that was that picture that I just showed you, um, they always have their wings outstretched because they need to dry. And it also is a specific adaptation because when they dive into the water to get the fish, um, it doesn't slow them down. So it makes them a little bit more streamlined. Um, and then again, like penguins are another good example. Um, they live in areas that are usually pretty cold, but there are some tropical penguins too. Um, but they usually have the ones that live in those cold areas. They have little less blood supply to their feet um, to better maintain that internal body temperature. So around their critical organs and their vital organs, uh, it needs to be warmer up here rather than their extremities like their feet. Um, a lot of these also true water birds, they nest and breed in the water. Uh, they also have bodies that are shaped a little bit different. Um, a lot of birds uh, will deep dive to catch fish. They have this what's called a fusiform shape or a tapered shape. Um, penguins are a great example. They're thin on both ends and then like thick in the middle. Um, that's so that when they move through the water, they can go really quickly and they're streamlined. Um, the birds that live around the water, um, as we might have guessed, they have a specific diet. So they eat a lot of things that come from the water. So crustaceans, they eat mollusks, a lot of fish, aquatic insects. So things that can be easily found in that aquatic environment. Most birds, um, like small ones, they really won't eat anything bigger than like an insect or a larva, but then you have larger birds like ospreys or cormorants, eagles, ibises, those true water birds, not ospreys, but cormorants, eagles, and ibises will eat larger fish or larger salamanders or frogs or things like that. All right, and then you have these semi-aquatic birds. So things like waterfowl and rails, um, they might be completely reliant on the water, but they spend a lot of time out of the water as well. It's mostly just seasonally that they're there and true aquatic or true um, water birds will need that again for their entire life cycle. So a lot of birds like waterfowl, they might nest and feed really close to those wetlands, but they might not actually be in the wetland. For instance, like a lot of migratory aquatic water birds, um, some of them are shorebirds. Um, they can't really live anywhere else but on wetlands, but they don't stick to one wetland. They move around. Um, they also change the nesting place based on that season. So during part of the year, they might be in the water. Part of the year, they might be out of the water. They're really close, like I mentioned, to that water, but they don't completely need it for their life cycle, their entire life cycle. 
All right, so um, some more characteristics that water birds have is again, they're unique for water. A lot of birds will have special feet. Um, if you're a birder or you just kind of know adaptations, um, beak and uh, feet are a really good way to kind of guess where that bird lives. And I'm sure most of us know that webbing on bird's feet probably means they have something to do with the water. So there's different types of webbing that they can have. Um, for instance, pelicans, they have webbing that completely covers their feet. But like ducks, they have webbing only on the base of their foot. Again, they spend a little bit more time out of the water. And then things like diving birds and loons, they have webbing between each individual digit on their feet. So again, just a little bit different um, depending on how they use that body of water. A lot of birds also have those waterproof feathers. Um, they have really long digits or claws even to move through those really flooded areas or soft surfaces where they could sink. If you know what um, uh, uh, like a coot is, they have those really specialized feet that are lobed. We'll talk about those here in a little bit. Um, that really helps them move through those mud flats as well. And then oftentimes like true water birds, they have very long legs so that they can move through those shallow waters. Um, best example would be like a uh, great blue heron or crane or something like that. All right, some more characteristics, um, wing development. So birds that live in the water have a special shape of wing um, because they might be adapted for flight and for swimming. Uh, penguins, obviously we don't have to worry about that. Um, again, they have what's called those fusiform wings because they're tapered at both ends. Uh, the shape of the beak is also really adapted for that aquatic living. Um, most of the time, birds that live in the water or by the water, they have a very sharp beak, um, like this loon here, or a great blue heron or a stork. Uh, but birds like a duck have a little bit more rounded body shape because they're a little bit more different and they use a filtering system within their beak. Uh, some beaks also have um, special, uh, they almost look like teeth, um, but they're not quite teeth, but it helps with that straining process because often the times when they eat, there's a lot of waterlogged areas. Uh, shorebirds have really thin beaks because they use it to wade through the shallow water and to kind of stir up that organic matter. And then ducks, like I mentioned, they have those filtering systems, which a lot of different birds have as well. All right, so that was just a quick overview about what a water bird is and some of those characteristics that they have. Um, we'll go ahead and talk about uh, different types of water birds in Nebraska. These could be true water birds, semi-aquatic birds, um, or even waterfowl. So I tried to pick a variety that we have. Um, oh, not quite yet, sorry. <laughs> We're doing some other stuff here, talking about the different types of birds. Um, so for instance, seabirds. We don't obviously have any of these in Nebraska, like true seabirds, like albatrosses, because we don't have oceans. Um, so groups of birds that are usually associated with either the coastline of the ocean or the sea, or actually the sea. Um, for instance, lots of birds that live in these areas, they actually spend not very much time on land. Um, they usually spend long periods of time away or they rarely come to land at all. Most of the time when they do come, it's to nest and to breed and that's it. Um, but they do look for other resources as well sometimes. Uh, their traits, they have to allow them to dive, to swim. They have to immerse themselves in the water to search for their food because they're not spending that time on land. And then most of these seabirds, they have to have a special gland. Not all of them, but most of them have a special gland that is used to eliminate that extra salt. So they're um, getting in the water, they're eating all that extra food that has salt in it, that salinity and they need to expel it. So oftentimes they will use a special gland that helps them do that. So true seabirds are things like the albatross, the great white pelican, and then the European storm petrel as well. All right, so wading birds. These are a bigger category. There's lots of them in here. Um, they like lots of different types of um, aquatic environments. This could be mangroves. This could be um, freshwater or saltwater. It could be Holmes Lake and Lincoln. There's lots of different ways um, that they could use and utilize that aquatic habitat. But they are found on pretty much every continent except Antarctica. Um, they're usually small to kind of a medium in size, but 
that's not always true. Great blue herons are pretty large. Um, they have super long legs and their beaks are usually pretty wide and they're sharp and they're long. Uh, these guys also usually have pretty elaborate plumage. Most of the time it's for that breeding purpose. Um, and then oftentimes people, when they see a bird, they usually confuse it with either a wading bird versus a shorebird. They look pretty similar, um, but again, it's the beak shape, it's the, it's the body size, um, it's the feet shape as well. Um, a lot of people consider herons a shorebird, but they're actually true wading birds. So there's the great blue heron, and then this photo actually is the green heron, a little bit smaller and a lot different colored. All right, so wading bird behavior, um, they're foraging. Um, if you ever watched a great blue heron, it's just a perfect example. They stand motionless in the water for very long periods of time, um, basically watching the water and waiting for something to come within reach. Um, when they step, it's often very slow um, and it's very deliberate in where they stand um, because they don't want to scare away the fish or the frogs or the salamanders that um, are coming near them. Uh, these guys also usually have pretty good sized communities. Um, the breeding areas that they um, um, live in or that they're found in are called rookeries. Uh, so if you see a large group of herons together, that's a rookery. Um, they also might be mixed flocks as well. Um, lots of water birds and waterfowl, you see them very closely interrelated to each other. Some birds kind of just stay within their groups. Waterfowl are pretty tight knit. Uh, vocalization, usually water birds, wading birds are way less vocal than other species because when you're looking for food, you need to be quiet. So they're not going to be like songbirds that are singing all of the time. Uh, their flight, they have really long legs and often they will um, extend or contract their neck depending on the type of bird. All right, so one of my favorite is they're not true water birds, but aquatic raptors. When we talk about these, these are things like kingfishers or ospreys. They spend time by the water, but they don't need the water for their entire life cycle. So um, they have different techniques really for those aerial predation. Um, most live along the shores or estuaries, but some of them can travel huge distances um, in search of their food. So again, not true water birds, um, but they really utilize those, um, those water aquatic areas as well. All right, and then you have your water fowl. So uh, a really good kind of idea here, identification tip I saw was that all water fowl are water birds, but not all water birds are water fowl. So kind of think about that, water birds, water fowl, not the same thing. When we talk about waterfowl, a lot of people group them with game birds, so ducks, geese. Uh, not always is that the case, though. There's a lot that you cannot hunt and are not game species, um, but generally they're in the order the Enceriformes group, um, ducks, swans, geese, that kind of thing. But they do have special um, aquatic uh, traits that they have. Uh, they do are associated a lot with the vegetation. So like I mentioned, the ducks, they have really good filtering systems within their beaks. Geese will have those too. Um, but again, they don't need the water for their entire life cycle. All right, so now we'll get to the point when we're talking about like true Nebraska birds. Um, and this is what we're gonna talk about just different types. So I there's a lot that I missed, um, but again, we only have so much time. And um, I'm gonna talk a lot about the different groups of water birds that we can see right here in Nebraska. All right, so one of them is kind of more towards that waterfowl, but their cool bird, um, northern pintail. Um, so these guys really like wetlands and lakes. They have that distinguishing long tail uh, in the back, that pointy tail. Um, these are usually the breeding males that have them. Um, they have really pretty plumage, like I mentioned, a little bit denser because they are in the water, um, but they breed in seasonal wetlands. So depending if it's the season that they're flooded or not, is depending on if they're going to be there or not. Um, they eat seeds, plants, worms, snails, crustaceans. Um, they forage usually along the shallower edges. Um, but again, these guys might be mixed in with lots of different other mallards or geese or even loons. Um, they're just, again, waterfowl kind of just don't care. They're all mixed together. All right. These guys... <laughs> 
their eyes freak me out, but they are a pretty cool uh, group of birds. Um, these guys are coots. A lot of people group them with like ducks and geese, but they're actually more related to cranes and rails. They don't look like it at all, but they are more related to that side rather than the ducks and geese. Uh, these guys, uh, this picture here, you can perfectly see their toes. Um, they don't have those really long slender toes, but they have this lobed foot. Um, so it's just that extra skin that really helps move through the water. Um, they have those really broad uh, feet, like I mentioned. It also helps support them on the sticky or that mucky ground that they're walking on. Uh, they're found in freshwater wetlands pretty much anywhere, um, but they do need aquatic vegetation and they need some sort of depth of standing water. Otherwise, they will not be there. Uh, these guys, when you watch them, they always look frantic, kind of like ducks. Um, they're, they're loud. And if you ever see them, they kind of, they have to get a running start in the water before they can take off. Uh, but they eat pretty much anything, insects, crustaceans, snails, tadpoles, and they can even take salamanders as well. Um, but they do dabble with their head underwater or they could go in on full dives too. Uh, one thing I also learned about these, I don't have a photo of it, but the baby coots, if you look them up, they're like bright red. They're kind of ugly. Um, but one of the things about them is like um, the, the parents are very uh, pretty much savage on the babies. So they will pick their favorite one and then they will not basically feed the other ones. They just focus on that one. Um, and so they have that intermittent hatching where one will hatch and then like two days later, one will hatch and then the next one, two days later. And then the parents will pick their favorite one and then just put all their resources into that one. And then the others, they just don't really care. So um, they're pretty savage. When it comes to their babies. All right, double crested cormorant. These birds also freak me out, but they are cool. And when I say freak out, they just, they look different than a lot of other birds. So, uh, but cormorants are really neat. A lot of anglers do not like these birds because they have such a high uh, diet on fish, um, but they're colonial water birds, um, mostly fish diets, but they will eat lots of other things like crustaceans and amphibians. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, these birds, they have a special, gland, um, but they don't have as much preen oil as other types of birds um, because uh, when they dive, they want to make sure that they're able to streamline through the water. Uh, and so when you see them, they often are in this position with their wings out. They're trying to dry them off. Uh, so it seems like a disadvantage for them being a water bird, but it actually helps them easier catch their prey. Um, so again, that agility and that speed is really more important for them than having waterproof feathers. And they have this really cool hooked beak right here. Um, and then they're really cool eyes as well. All right. This is the American Avocet. Um, these guys are very long and that thin upturned beak. Uh, males usually are black and they have the white back and then they have that kind of rusty red head color. But they like to for forage in the shallow fresh waters and wetlands. Um, they eat things like beetles, water boatmen, which are like the little things that look like they're walking on the water, midges, shrimp, I mean, pretty much anything. So why do they have this long beak? Um, they will use it when they're in the water and they will sweep it from side to side. It's known as skiving. And this is how they're looking for their food. They're stirring up that organic matter in the water to hopefully stir up some food so that they can grab it. But they will also peck and plunge their beak into there. Um, one thing I also did not know about these guys is everyone gives... Um, Cowbirds, brown-headed cowbirds, a bad reputation because they engage in something called brood parasitism. Um, they will lay their eggs in other uh, uh, birds' nests. And then the idea is that the other female will raise those uh, birds instead of her own. Um, American avocets actually do that as well too. Not very often, but it has been seen quite frequently. All right. Western Grebe, these guys are kind of cute. They have that long neck and that bright red eye, and then their babies always ride on the back of them. 
but again, huge long neck um, because they're looking and uh, foraging in those waters. They eat things like salamanders, crustaceans, grasshoppers, aquatic insects. They use that sharp, straight bill to quickly jab their prey and basically impale it. Um, they are known for this um, breeding dance that they do. It's called rushing. Um, basically, the male and the female will mirror each other um, and then uh, go from there. Um, but the young, like I mentioned, will ride on the backs of the adults and they will start doing this like minutes after they hatch. But these guys are found on those freshwater lakes and marshes. Um, one of the things that they also do is they may breed when they move to the lakes, but they will completely molt all of their flight feathers. So they literally cannot fly for a while until they regrow those feathers in. So they are super crucial and um, needed on those um, water bodies. They, they literally cannot um, have a life cycle without those water bodies. All right, I know a lot of people love these guys, the belted kingfishers. Um, they kind of fit within that aquatic raptor group. So they have this kind of messy looking crown that they can um, actually raise and lower at will, um, depending on how they feel, but they have that long beak that they use to um, grab their food. So they'll usually sit on like a branch or a uh, bridge or something and look down into the water. And when they're ready, they will take flight, they'll close their eyes, and then they will dive into the water, grab them, pinch them, and then uh, usually bring that food back up to a perch and they will pound it on the pavement or the branch to kill the food. And then and they will swallow it whole. They're pretty much found anywhere, streams, rivers, ponds, lakes, estuaries. They eat pretty much anything, crayfish, mollusks, uh, amphibians, reptiles. These guys, uh, a lot of people have never seen their nests or where they use them, but they actually do it in vertical um, earth banks. So for instance, if you have ever like kayaked on the Niobrara or the Platte or anything, and you see holes in there, it could be the belted kingfisher. So they actually will nest in the holes on the bank. All right, these guys are kind of cute little spotted sandpipers. Um, this is the most widespread sandpiper that we have in North America. They're pretty much found on any form of freshwater, um, lake streams, and even the seacoast. Uh, they have those pretty spots on their belly. Uh, they eat midges, mayflies, crustaceans. Uh, they use that, again, long beak to probe into the sand or the mud. Uh, they're one of the few shorebirds too that when, uh, danger comes up them, or if they feel threatened, they will dive underwater. They're one of the only shorebirds that, to actually do that. Uh, these guys also, they constantly bob their tail when they're standing, and then they fly with their wings held in a cup-like shape, and they barely ever reach that horizontal peak. So they're usually in that cup shape instead of being almost like a full 180 degrees. All right, killdeer. Um, these guys are pretty common. I'm sure everyone has seen them. They aren't necessarily a true water bird because you'll see them in parking lots and agricultural fields. Um, they're pretty opportunistic foragers. So if they're not finding what they need by the water, they will go somewhere else. Uh, but they have that pretty distinctive band around their neck. And then they also have their pretty distinctive, um, where they get their name, uh, call. So you'll hear the kill deer, kill deer. Um, they're pretty found, much out found anywhere, like I mentioned. Uh, one thing that's neat about these birds is they're really known, especially the females, for something called the broken wing impression. Uh, so if you get close to the um, nest with the babies in it, whether you're a person, whether you're a coyote or something, this bird will actually get your attention pretending it has a broken wing. And the idea is that you follow the bird because you want to eat the bird and then it flies way over away from its babies. And then all of a sudden, just as you go to eat it, it flies away. Um, so taking you again away from her nest, um, so that you don't eat her young, uh, one of the things though is for me, it's really hard to see the killdeer nests anyway. Uh, they blend in really well with their environment. So we're not sure why they do that broken wing impression. It might be just, again, an extra insurance policy that they don't get eaten, but still kind of a cool adaptation. All right, this is the only species of this type of duck 
found in North America, but they have a super cool beak. They live up to their name, the Northern Shoveler, because they have a shovel nose beak. I wish I could have found a photo for you with the actual bird um, with its face out of the water. But apparently that's one of the like identification tips is that their beak is usually always in the water. They're always stirring up stuff to find food, um, but they use things like shallow wetlands. Um, they really need submerged vegetation because that's where they get a lot of their foods. Um, they eat things like tiny crustaceans, aquatic invertebrates, seeds, and just like other types of ducks, they have that really cool projections on their bill called lamellae, and they will use them to filter out and strain all of the different foods that they're eating. So they don't want to eat the water and all the other crud. They're looking to eat just the um, aquatic invertebrates or the seeds or whatever they're looking for. Um, they're usually seen in pretty small flocks, usually about five to 10. All right. So these guys are migrators to Nebraska. Um, they come in in the spring and they leave in the fall. They have usually huge groups when you look at them, but we have the pretty American white pelicans. We don't have the ugly brown like Gulf pelicans. Um, so if you've ever seen Finding Nemo, the Gulf pelicans are the ones that dive into the water and take the, the bunch of the water out with them and with the fish inside of it. American white pelicans do not do that. I'm sorry, they don't like dive into the water to catch their fish. Um, they're usually sitting in the water and they just use their beak to kind of scoop it up. So um, one of these guys, they will found mostly on like isolated islands in fresh or shallow waters. They usually have a huge diet of fish, but it totally depends on where they're found and the water levels that they're being found in and also that prey abundance. So some types of pelicans, uh, depending on where they are, 100% fish, that's all they eat. But um, I saw some uh, papers that talked about different pelicans that have been found in different areas where fish are lacking. They'll have a whole diet of just like crustaceans and crayfish and salamanders. So um, they will change their diet depending on where they are and the prey and the water level and also that prey abundance. So they're pretty flexible and adaptive to when they eat different foods. All right, and then we could not talk about the great blue heron. These are really tall birds. They have the weirdest call if you ever see them. I am not going to do it, but go ahead and Google that. Um, it sounds like kind of like a barking dog if you get uh, close. And then when they fly away, they just have this like gibberish amount of words that come out of their mouth. And um, it's an interesting call. So they're found in both freshwater and saltwater. There's the great blue heron. And then there's also the green heron. Green herons are way smaller. Great blue herons can get about three feet, uh, but they almost look kind of like storks or um, cranes, but they will grab food with their bill. They often impale fish or um, frogs or something like that. And then they shake them to death before they just swallow them whole. Um, but again, they have those very deliberate footings and they're very quiet when they walk and they usually don't move. So if you see a heron in the water, not really moving, we can probably assume that it's hunting for its food. Uh, also something that's an identification feature is if you see a large bird flying, these guys are one of the only ones that hold their neck in an S shape, and then their legs are extended behind them. Other birds usually have their legs, their arm extended or their neck extended. These guys hold it in an S shape. All right, so those are our birds that we have in Nebraska. But I always like to end on some other birds that are in the world, because even though I love Nebraska and I love talking about our native species, there's still a lot of other things out there that are also very cool that relate to what we're talking about today. So. Um, let's go ahead and talk about penguins. So classic water bird, everyone knows what a penguin looks like. There's lots of different types of penguins, um, but they are pretty easily distinguished from other types of birds based mostly on their coloration um, and the way that they walk. So again, if you look at penguins, they have kind of like a pointy little head and then they get a little bit fatter in the middle and then they kind of taper down. That's again, that fusiform shape. So their wings, their first um, two wings here that they have, they have been modified into flippers because obviously they can't fly and they need to swim more than they don't need to fly. Um, but they live pretty much anywhere um, uh, south of the equator, but they're not all cold 
weather penguins. Um, if you've ever been to the Lincoln Children's Zoo, the ones there, they hate cold weather. They like the warm. So um, there's also the tropical Galapagos penguins. They definitely don't like the cold either, but there are penguins that live in the cold too. Uh, these guys spend about 75% of their entire life at sea, mostly coming back to lay eggs, to protect their eggs, to incubate them, and to mate, and that's about it. Um, but they breed, and they also molt on land. It's very hard to swim when all your feathers are gone and you're molting, so you pretty much need to come on land to protect yourself. Um, they're also countershaded. It's a perfect example of this. So if you look at a penguin's belly, they're pretty white. And then their um, back is pretty black. So uh, when you're a predator and if you're on in the air and you're looking down, you will notice that they're dark like the water. But if you're a predator and you're looking up, the white is supposed to kind of reflect with the sun. And so it's supposed to camouflage them from predators above and below. All right, so a lot of people think penguins and these guys and puffins are really closely related. So they're not, they have similar colors. They might live in similar habitats, but they're two completely different types of birds. <coughs> um, so they're called ox. There's about 22 species of what we call diving birds. So this is like a puffin, if you think about a puffin. Um, birds in this family are sometimes called alcids, um, but they're about medium-sized seabirds. They have barrel-shaped bodies, very short tails, and then huge, thick beaks. Um, they're very good swimmers and they're very good divers, um, but they mostly live in the Arctic and subarctic and uh, Northern temperate regions. Uh, they usually have huge colonies on the ledges of cliffs or rock crevices. And here, these are one of those birds that are solely dependent on the sea for their food, um, their fish that they eat, the crustaceans, the mollusks, the plankton, whatever they're feeding on. All right, so I picked storks on here. Not every stork is like this because there's some that are not water birds, but I specifically picked um, wood storks, which is the picture here. Not the most charismatic or sexy looking bird. I totally understand that, but it is also a very good water bird. So these guys have the, again, those long legs, that heavy pointy bill. Um, they have kind of white feathers on them, um, but they're black when they're in flight. Um, so you can kind of see the little black underneath. So when they're outstretched, they're black, but they forage in places like swamps, wetlands, ponds. Um, they need at least four to 12 inches of water at all times. They will not be in an area that has less than about four inches of water. So very similar to a heron, they walk, um, looking for their prey or feeling for their prey. Um, they use their beak to snap it closed and to eat it. Um, and they will also push their feet up and down in the water. They just kind of move up and down to kind of stir and startle the prey. Um, they will also flick their wings because it looks like a bird or something um, from the outside is coming to get the animals underneath. So it startles them as well. So it's one of their prey um, grabbing techniques. All right, so the Jonicas. So these guys, um, there's a really good example at the Omaha Zoo. If you ever go to the Desert Dome, um, it's probably about the third or fourth exhibit that you see. Uh, these guys are sometimes called Jesus birds or lily trotters because it literally looks like they are walking on water. They're true wading birds. They have long legs um, and they really help them walk on that aquatic vegetation. Um, so they have long, big legs. It helps spread that body weight over a large area, and it helps them literally walk on the water. Uh, good swimmers, great divers. They eat insects. Um, they're not good flyers. They can fly short distances, but not for very long. Uh, this is another species that will kind of pick a location and stick to it because they will molt all of their flight feathers, um, and then they can't fly until those new ones come in. So there's about eight different species, and they're found mostly in the tropical areas of the world. All right, these birds are super cool. I like their eyes. They're called oyster catchers. Um, you can probably guess what they eat a lot of, but they're very large shorebirds that are found in the Atlantic and the Gulf Coast beaches. Some of the southern, more southern birds down there, they're permanent residents, but then the more northern ones, they're actually um, will come south for the winter. Uh, these guys, they will jab their bill into an oyster. 
that they eat a lot of oysters, um, or they have a great technique of basically hammering it on the ground until it cracks and breaks, and then they will eat it. So, but they will also eat things like sea urchins, jellyfish, other small creatures, um, marine worms. And then again, like most other birds, they just uh, forage in the shallow water and looking for their food by sight. All right, and then last one, um, probably my favorite bird, second favorite, turkey vultures are first, second favorite, flamingos. Um, so these guys, there's about six species in the world. They're pretty recognizable. I'd probably say right up there with penguins. Everyone knows what a flamingo is. Um, they're tall pink wading birds. They have this huge hook shaped downturn bill. This is what they do to um, find their food. But again, long necks, super long necks. These guys are huge community birds. You always see them in huge flocks. Um, they stand on one leg. We all know that. That's kind of like a characteristic thing of a flamingo. We're not exactly sure why they do it. Um, is it because they're trying to uh, change their body temperature or keep it warmer? Are they trying to conserve their energy? Or are they just trying to dry their legs out? We're not exactly sure. But they use their really large beak to stir up that organic matter with their web feet. They eat lots of things like algae, invertebrates. Um, one thing you might see too is when flamingos put their head in the water, they swing it from side to side. They're filtering and they're straining all that different stuff in the water so that they can eat it. Um, why are they pink? comes from their food. So um, it's the special pigments in these, um, what's called carotenoids, and they eat special stuff and it changes their color. So if they don't eat those special things, they will turn white. So in zoos, they will either have to ship in special stuff, which a lot of them do, and it's quite pricey, or sometimes if they don't have quite the right amount of food to keep their pretty colors, they'll add just a little bit of food coloring in there. So um, it does actually change um, their colors a little bit, but it's never gonna look like it would actually do in the wild. All right, so that was it. That was our uh, science of waiting birds. Um, I don't have specific dates yet, but I'd probably say mid January. So again, if you have something that you would like to see, um, or you're interested in, please go ahead. When I send those evaluations out, please say, I would like to see a science of something. So it helps me give ideas as well, because I can think of stuff that I would like to do, but I want to know what people want to hear too. So join us back in 2023 in January. So like always, we will record these and we'll go ahead and put them on our education YouTube channel. They're under a special uh, playlist called Science Of. And then we also have social media. We have uh, Instagram and Facebook. Please follow us on there. And then uh, just a general wildlife education website where you can find downloadable things and you can see um, different lessons and stuff for teachers on there as well. So lots of different resources for everyone. And then that is all that I have. I usually have a join me next week for something, but we don't have that this time. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. And I think we have a few different questions. Um, why are waterfowl called waterfowl? Um, well, it looks like someone uh, gave a, a link to that something about the northern shoveler. I'm not exactly sure why they're called waterfowl. Um, clearly the water portion, I'm sure you've got there. Um, but uh, the fowl portion, I think that kind of just relates to the types of birds that you normally see. Um, when we talk about things like chicken, grouse, like pheasants and that kind of stuff, but then you also talk about like ducks and geese, uh, that fowl portion is sometimes referred to things that are domesticated. Um, and so my guess is that's where it comes from, but I'm not hundred percent sure on that. Um, I've been like three feet from one of these in the wild and it buzzed at me. I'm not sure which thing you were talking about. Um, Holly near a nest. Um, someone asked, what are the ducks of Nebraska? Where, what are the ducks to Nebraska? Um, not sure what you're asking, just different types of duck species that we have. Um, there's a lot of them. I didn't really include any ducks today. I guess I should have. Um, mallard ducks are probably obviously the most common ones that you're going to find. Wood ducks are really neat too. They have very, very pretty breeding colors. Um, and then 
People like blue herons. Yep, I did not even touch on teals or widgeons. Absolutely, there are tons of other different ones that I didn't even mention. But again, we only have about 45 minutes. So we could do a whole nother science of just waterfowl, but yes. Um, hopefully that helps people answer your questions. Um, otherwise, like I mentioned, um, oh, someone asked, are seagulls and terns not ocean birds? So technically they are. A lot of people call us and ask like, why are we seeing seagulls in Nebraska? They're in like parking lots. Um, they they technically are mostly on the coast, but um, they've just made homes in Nebraska like over time. Um, two of the turns that we have in Nebraska, they are, um, one of them is uh, threatened and endangered as well. Um, so they are technically ocean birds, but some of them don't need the ocean for their entire life cycle. So some of them are only found on those coastlines and some of them can be found here in Nebraska as well. All right, is there a bird rehab in Nebraska? Um, yeah, um, the only kind of thing I would have to say about the rehab is that's something that Game and Parks does not do. And we like personally, that's not something that Nebraska Game and Parks does. That would be like a private organization like Nebraska Wildlife Rehab. Um, so I, it, it would be interesting. Um, there have been some stories of things where we have given people, um, different organizations, if someone like found an eagle or a hawk or an owl or something, we would call like raptor rehab. Um, but um, yeah, please fill out those valuations. That's how I get all that stuff. So um, what is a good resource for ducks? Um, good question there. Um, I haven't looked specifically just because I'm not a waterfowl hunter or, or anything like that. Um, but I would assume that Nebraska Game and Parks' website um, would really talk a lot about um, the different types that you see. But my guess is that's more catering towards the game birds that you can hunt. Um, their Audubon is always a good site. Um, I know it's not specifically for Nebraska, but it will show you pretty much anything in the United States. So someone said we need a science of ducks possibly please fill out those evaluations that's how we decide so all right well thank you everyone I hope you have a great holiday um, and a great rest of your year and we will see you um, hopefully in January so just watch our social media and watch press releases and listservs and we will hopefully get that information to you so have a great rest of your year and we'll see you next year bye